after that lower than expected consumer sentiment reading, we are seeing these stocks continuing to move to the downside after a big week of inflation data showing inflation pressures easing back in some categories. We also saw an uptick in jobless claims. So what can we expect for the economy moving forward? Joining us to discuss, we've got Bob Arnott, Research Affiliates founder and chairman. Bob, thank you so much for, Rob rather, I'm sorry, thank you so much for being here with us. So I want to talk about your reaction to these consumer sentiment numbers that we are getting in here and how it kind of relates to the totality of the data, not to sound like Jay Powell, that we've gotten this week. Does this change your overall thesis at all? No, not really. <clears throat> we love finding asymmetries in risk. And um, uh, consensus about the economy, about the markets, uh, is usually largely correct, but it's pretty useless because it's already baked into the price, 100% reflected in share prices. So the way to win is to ask where the consensus might be wrong. Consensus expectations suggest a mild softening of growth and a, a gradual last mile in the easing of inflation. Is that possible? Of course it is, but the risks are asymmetric. Most would agree that the economic growth uh, is more likely to surprise to the downside and inflation is more likely to surprise to the upside. Uh, we look at the economy and uh, see the PMI in inventories, yield curve slope and th three year trend in uh, cost of capital. They're all strong predictors of slowdown or recession. All four are in their worst quartile ever. The latter two are in their worst decile ever. So the only thing sustaining current economic growth is a wealth effect from the bull market and consumer spending. The asymmetries of risk are that the economy can do much worse than consensus far more easily than it can do much better than consensus. So Rob, I guess given those concerns, and <clears throat> first just talk to me about the downside that you potentially see as a result of all that. What do you think that looks like and what should investors then <clears throat> potentially be waiting for if you don't think now it doesn't sound like is the right time to buy? Well, <clears throat> we can watch for shocks this year on the economy, more likely on the downside than the upside, on inflation, more likely on the upside than the downside, on geopolitics. Geopolitics is fraught many places around the world. I, I don't think the risks to Taiwan are totally off the table for this year. It's not impossible President Xi decides uh, I'll never have a better chance to take Taiwan um, with the U.S. so thoroughly distracted. None of these things are in current pricing. Domestic politics has been fraught, to say the least, and is not going to get any nicer or any tidier between now and November. So there will be great buying opportunities in the next couple of years. This, uh, this is not one of them. Okay, well, it's interesting because you have this idea, yes, you want to bet against consensus. That's how you find an edge, of course. But you've got the top five names driving 80% of the gains in the market this year. Explain to me how you make money with that viewpoint, right? If the top five names are going to be driving the majority of the gains, how can you afford to bet against consensus when there is this much concentration? Well, you should definitely bet on those top five names uh, as long as you have some sort of uh, crystal ball that tells you when to get out. <laughs> okay, I've well, tell me what the crystal ball is. Do you have a, do you have a take? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> bubbles persist until they don't. Um, uh, I've written a lot about bubbles over the years, and we uh, developed a, a definition for bubble that you can use in real time. Uh, back in 2018. And that definition is that you have to use implausible, not impossible, but implausible assumptions to justify the current share price of an asset or of a market. Uh, 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 in a discounted cash flow or other valuation model. And the second confirming part of the definition is that the marginal buyer doesn't care about valuation models. Uh, NVIDIA is a fabulous company with enormous profits, enormous growth, enormous potential, but it's priced at over 40 times sales. Uh, now, yes, yeah, sales are doubling this year versus last year, so it's 20 times next year's sales. That's still an enormous multiple of sales. Uh, uh, Tesla, you've been talking about lately. Firstly, as, as for the shareholder vote, I enthusiastically endorse the notion that a deal is a deal and that the Chancery Court had absolutely no right to void something that was voted on by shareholders 
um, and that paid off massively for Elon Musk in a context where he delivered the goods. He delivered spectacular growth and he earned that payoff. So I, I support the vote, but the share price is, as your last um, uh, panelist or uh, last discussant said, the, the share price is a massive multiple to uh, sales and profits. So we're looking at bubbly behavior. Now, bubbles don't necessarily mean that the growth is impossible. Can one of these companies turn out to grow sufficiently to justify astronomical multiples? Yeah, it can happen. But uh, the likelihood of uh, uh, all of them continuing to deliver is slim to none. Uh, the top of the dot-com bubble, the 10 most valuable tech stocks in the world in the year 2000, how many of them had beat the S&P over the next 15 years? Zero. Not one of them. How many beat the S&P over the next 20 years? One. Microsoft. That's it. So when you get to frothy, bubbly behavior, it's time to be careful. I'm not saying short these stocks. Um, shorting a bubble is very dangerous yeah. because bubbles can go longer and further than you can possibly imagine. So Rob, I, I, I guess my question then is, what happens next? What should investors do if they are invested in some of these names? It sounds like it's not just maybe those at the top that we're just seeing that bubble-like behavior how do people protect themselves then? And what do you think is going to be that catalyst? I have a lot of questions here. What is going to be that catalyst <laughs> that is going to cause that bubble then to potentially burst? Well, uh, consumer spending um, faltering uh, can take a lot of froth out of the market. Uh, markets move based on liquidity. And so if liquidity is withdrawn from the system, uh, that can do damage. If inflation exceed, uh, exceeds expectations to the upside, uh, we're not saying that inflation is going to uh, go crazy anytime soon, but we're not saying that risk is totally off the table because our policies uh, out of Washington, D.C. are reckless. So when it comes to uh, what investors should do, if you if you have heavy exposure to these stocks, what's the harm in taking your initial investment out and yeah, play with house money? Uh, uh, that's a, a very, very simple expedient that can make a lot of sense. Where should you invest? Non-U.S. stocks are cheap for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, things get cheap for a reason. But those reasons can change too. The asymmetries of risk with European stocks and emerging market stocks are to the upside, not the downside. And so we see lots of opportunity for investing outside the U.S. and outside of the tech sector. I've been called a perma bear at times. I'm not a bear when things are, are cheap. And there's a lot of cheap things out there. They just aren't the so-called Magnificent Seven. And by the way, whoever coined the expression Magnificent Seven obviously didn't see the movie. Four of the seven are dead at the end of the movie. <laughs> well, you know, there's still a lot of people that are trying to take credit for, for coining the Mag Seven term. Rob or not, Rob or not, it was great to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us in Yahoo Finance. We hope to have you back. Thanks a lot.